All right. Um, so uh, just to give you a big picture overview of this talk, basically it's about exploring how n-grams can be used to automatically classify and learn about music. Um, and I'm going to, during the course of this talk, talk about the results of some experiments that we did where we applied machine learning and statistical analysis to process n-gram data um, from, that was extracted from digital scores, in particular MIDI files. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to be emphasizing in this talk is that we didn't use the n-grams directly in our analysis. What we did is we extracted features um, from the n-grams um, and use that as the basis for performing the, the machine learning and training our models. Um, also, the work that I'm going to be presenting focuses on Renaissance music, but there's nothing about these techniques that is specific to Renaissance music. So you could really adapt them to any music that can be represented as a MIDI file. Um, some of the people in this audience are probably very familiar with n-grams. They're a uh, common technique in some, some uh, fields of, of the digital humanities. Uh, but for those who aren't, um, what they are essentially is a way of representing sequences. Um, they're commonly used in computational linguistics, so you could have um, a six gram to represent the sequence of words to be or not to be. Um, you could break that into two grams, um, so you would have to be, be or, um, and so on. So that's the basic idea for an n-gram. Um, they've been used in many other fields, for example, a way of modeling uh, sequences of base pairs uh, for, for DNA. Um, and one of the things I'll be uh, talking about today is some of the intricacies um, and benefits that you can get from trying to adapt n-grams to be used um, in music, which has certain difficulties you don't necessarily see um, elsewhere. The other major uh, concept I want to introduce right from the beginning um, is the notion of a feature, because a feature, um, that term can mean different things in different disciplines. So when I'm talking about a feature in this talk, what I mean is a piece of information that measures a characteristic of something, in this case a piece of music, in a simple, consistent, and precisely defined way. Um, a feature can be represented using a number, either a single value or a set of related values, a feature vector like, for example, um, the, the frequency values of uh, histogram bits. Um, the way we're going to be talking about features here, too, is uh, looking at how they summarize uh, information for a piece of music globally. So it's really looking at the, an overall characterization of the music um, in a macro sense and not looking um, at what's happening more in a, a local sense. Um, and that's something that um, is going to be really important when we're talking about how engrams, how you can adapt uh, local elements into the macro context. Um, also, I should mention that we're going to be extracting features here from pieces in their whole, um, so entire pieces or from, from major sections. It's also possible to extract uh, engrams or features in general from uh, smaller windows of music. Um, in this case, we haven't done that, but it's very much possible as well. To give you a simple example of a feature, you could take this little melody and you could define a feature called range. Um, and you could define it as the difference in semitones between the lowest and highest pitches. In this case, the highest pitch is G, the lowest is C. The difference is seven, so therefore the difference is uh, seven semitones. So the value of the feature is just seven. Um, so it fulfills all the requirements of features that I just prevented, presented here. You have a number, it gives you a number that not only uh, can be consistently extracted, but you can use it as a, as a basis for comparison. As an example of multi-dimensional features, um, you can take, for example, the pitch class histogram. So this is a histogram of 12 bins. Each bin corresponds to a different enharmonic pitch class. Um, and then the value of the bin represents the frequency or the relative frequency of each of the pitch classes. Um, and you can see that here. Um, there's four pitch classes in this particular melody. That's why all the other bins are, are zero. And you can see how common certain pitch classes are to, to one another. So once you've done this, you could extract a bunch of features and you can compare two pieces. So in this case, uh, these are two famous pieces by uh, Josquin and Akagem, um, two Renaissance composers. So you have a few different features. You can say, um, you know, the range for this piece is this, the range for that piece is that, and you can perform these sort of manual analyses. And that can be useful. Um, but what's more useful is when you actually have not just a few features, but you have hundreds or thousands of features. Um, and that way you can really explore music in a fairly sophisticated way. Um, things get even more interesting when you have not only uh, two pieces that you're comparing, but hundreds or thousands of different pieces that you're comparing. So you have um, this ability to group those pieces into uh, classes or categories of interest. So you could say all of these pieces uh, by this composer go here, all these other pieces by this composer go there, and you can model compositional style. Similarly, you could model genre, you could model regional style, um, you could look at how features change over time. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different possibilities there. 
So the next question then is how do you extract the features? Um, in our case, we've created a piece of software called JSON Bollock um, that's been around in various forms for uh, a little over 20 years. Um, and it basically takes an MIDI file and automatically extracts a bunch of features from them. Um, and the software is free and open source. Um, it tries to cast a fairly broad net in terms of the types of features that it extracts. Um, so you can look at different aspects of music. Um, so the features uh, relate to pitch statistics as a whole, melody and horizontal intervals, chords and vertical intervals, texture, rhythm, instrumentation, and dynamics. So you really get a pretty broad look at kinds uh, of characteristics of music that somebody might be interested in. Now the challenge here is if you recall when I was introducing features, I was talking about how there's something that really give you the macro big picture view of the music. But of course in music, what's happening locally matters. Also, the sequence with which things happen is critical in music. So a lot of the features that um, the current release version of JSON Bollock 2.2 extracts um, only have a very limited or no representation of sequence. They just look at the global performance or the global characteristics of, of music. And you can do some very useful things with that. So, uh, but what you want to do, if you can, is at the one hand, maintain this ability to have these really uh, simple, easy to compare features that tell you something globally across a piece of music, but that also encapsulate information about the sequencing. Um, and that's our motivation for um, using n-grams and incorporating them into the JSON Bollock feature catalog. Um, but as I mentioned before, there's problems with using raw n-grams to, to do this. For example, um, in music, you have a lot of parallelisms. So you'll have multiple different voices that, that are co-occurring. Um, you can have a single voice or a single instrument play multiple pitches at the same time. Um, so these create uh, complexities. Um, also, you're going to have sets of different, uh, a, a list of different engrams that could be of different sizes. So it makes it difficult to compare them directly across different pieces because the engrams in different pieces are going to be different. Um, so the solution to this is to not use the, the engrams directly, but as I mentioned before, to extract features from them. Um, so in the newest uh, development version of JSON Bollock, version 3, um, which is currently undergoing final testing, we've implemented a bunch of new features, um, some of which are completely unrelated to engrams. But among the new features are 76 features specifically uh, based around engrams. So those are the features that I'm going to focus on today. Um, so to understand how we can adapt engrams uh, to music, taking into account these uh, parallelisms and other issues I mentioned, um, it's important to start with the idea of a note onset slice. So, so a note onset slice is basically a set of notes that are co-occurring in the music. And a new slice occurs whenever a new note starts. So you can see over here um, a sample of music with two voices. Um, the, the vertical dos or dashed lines, those each indicate a different slice. So the first slice, for example, contains an A and a C. And for each of these slices, you have a list of different pitches, or in some cases, there's variants that are pitch classes that are present. Um, so these are great because they provide you with a certain way of structuring the music, because they, they, they're a kind of base unit that you compare. So you kind of combine all the things that happen in parallel into single individual units. So each slice is the thing that forms the basic unit for forming um, the musical engrams. Um, and you can uh, use engrams that represent different kinds of information, like rhythm, melody, uh, and verticality. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. Um, so here we have uh, a simple piece of music, uh, two voices again. Uh, in this case, uh, three slices, again, the, the dashed line separating them. Um, and you can extract some different engrams from them. So you could have, for example, a rhythmic three gram uh, for the upper voice, consisting of two, two, four, um, because there's two half notes and then a whole note. Um, you could also have a melodic interval n-gram, in this case a melodic interval 2-gram, um, for the top voice, which would be minus 2 plus 2 um, diatonically. Um, you could also have a vertical interval 3-gram, 7, 6, 8, because those are the vertical intervals that occur in each of the, the three slices. Um, and then you could combine that information into a contrapuntal n-gram, um, which you can see in the bottom here, um, that takes into account both the horizontal and the vertical elements simultaneously. And these are just a few examples. There are a lot of details um, that you can play around with to get different kinds of engrams. Um, so I won't go into all of those details, but just to highlight some key points, um, there's some decisions that you have to make when you decide to use engrams and apply them to music. First of all, are you really sure that engrams are what you want to use? Because there are alternatives. There's SIP grams, there's flex grams. Um, they're, they're not the only way of representing sequences in this kind of way. 
Also, the value of n could be something that matters a lot. Um, and we've done a lot of experiments looking at the effect of n. And it turns out that if you use n equals 2, you end up with not a left structure uh, being modeled. On the other hand, if you use values of n that are greater um, than 3, you end up having a whole bunch of rare n-grams appearing that can kind of obscure some of the patterns that you're looking for. So we found that n equals 3 is sort of the Goldilocks uh, size of an n-gram that sort of just works just right. Um, but of course, that's just in the work we've looked at. There could be other kinds of music. Other kinds of purposes where different values of n are better. Um, decisions about which voices you want to be considering are important too. You can construct n-grams for every voice. You can uh, uh, sort of as a whole, you can construct n-grams for each individual voice. You can look at just the outer voices, just the top voice, just the bass voice. Um, there's lots of, of ways you can approach that. Um, also, there's different varieties of note onset sizes that can have an effect um, and a whole other range of details. For example, do you use pitches or do you wrap them down to pitch classes? Um, and again, uh, if you have questions about that, I can, I can go into more detail later on that. Um, we're certainly not the first people to do work uh, in music with n-grams. Um, there's at least 15 years now of people doing some really interesting things with n-grams, especially contrapuntal n-grams. Um, but as far as I know, we're the first ones to extract features from n-grams and use that um, as the basis for training models using machine learning. Um, all right, so let's turn now to that. Our sort of final uh, technique um, is how can you extract features from the n-grams themselves? We want to end up, if you recall, with standardized simple numbers that can be easily and consistently compared. That's, um, that's the goal of this. So to do that, um, we can, Jason Bollock will calculate uh, a range of different n-grams for, for the music and then extract the features from them. Um, an important step in doing that can be to calculate histograms, where for each n-gram, you calculate the relative, hist or the relative frequency of how often that n-gram occurs in the music compared to um, other n-grams of the same kind. Um, and there's many different ways of doing that. Um, you could look at all possible n-gram permutations. You could pre-select certain n-grams that are, you think are going to be especially interesting. For example, example ones having to do with cadential patterns. Um, you can also sort the most frequent n-grams in each piece individually and then have a, a comparison um, across different pieces of the histograms in, in that way. Um, or you can also use the histograms as the basis for calculating other features, so having derivative features uh, calculated from the histograms, as well as using the histograms directly as features, as, as multidimensional features. Um, to give examples of these sorts of things, you can have features that, uh, that look at how uh, often specific n-grams occur, again, ones of particular interest, or maybe just ones that are most common. Um, you can say not only which ones are most important, but how often are they, are they occurring relative to one another. Um, and in particular, we found that the kinds of features that work the best are ones that measure the diversity of n-grams. Does a, a piece have a whole bunch of different kinds of rhythmic n-grams, for example? Um, does it have very little variety in the terms of n-grams? Are there certain ones that dominate? Um, is it more sort of spread out? So those kinds of characterizing features, um, as, as we'll see in a moment from our experiments, seem to be especially important, at least in the music that we've looked at. Um, so Jason Bollock, as I mentioned, calculates uh, 76 different uh, features based on n-grams. Uh, for now, we use n equals 3 um, for all of these features. As I said, this is something that can be changed in Jason Bollock if we want to, and we've played around in the past. We may play around with it again in the future. Um, but of these n-grams, it focuses specifically on rhythmic, melodic, and vertical ones. Um, and there's a few different varieties, for example, vertical n-grams that only consider outer voices versus vertical n-grams that consider all voices. All right, so now that we know about the, the basic methodology that's being used, um, we decide to test it out. So we took three experiments that we'd previously published separately uh, between 2017 and 2019, where we'd used Jason Bollock 2.2 features, which is say Jason Bollock features without n-grams, uh, that don't use n-grams at all. Um, so we took the results of those experiments and then we ran them again. Um, and we did one version where we had only the n-gram features being used and another version where we had the n-gram features combined with the original features uh, to see what kinds of, of performance we had. Um, when we did this, uh, the only input to uh, everything we were doing was JSON Bollock features, and we used those features um, to train uh, models using machine learning. In particular, we used support vector machines, um, and then we classified the music in various different ways. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see the results. These are all classification accuracies resulting from tenfold cross-validation. 
So here are the three different experiments, one uh, in each row. The first one was on composer, comparing uh, the work of two Renaissance composers, Josquin and Pierre Delarue, both of which are composers um, of, of fairly similar styles, so they can be difficult to distinguish. Um, the second was looking at uh, different uh, Renaissance genres, so madrigals, motets, and fortula and volote. And then finally, looking at regional style, trying to distinguish, again, Renaissance, Franco, Flemish, masses and motets from Iberian uh, masses and motets. And as you can see from uh, the, the results here, um, each of those three experiments ended up giving somewhat different results. Um, in the case of composer, engrams didn't make a big difference. Um, the combined classification, when you combine the two different feature groups, was slightly higher than the original features without engrams, but there was no statistical significance there. Um, in the case of genre, the engram features operating alone caused a huge improvement relative to the original uh, features with no engrams. Um, and in fact, the engram features acting alone were significantly better than the combined features. Um, and in the case of regional style, combining uh, the features, uh, the engram features and the original features ended up significantly improving uh, classification accuracy. So um, three different patterns emerging in each of those three experiments. Um, in addition to looking at just the classification accuracy, we also looked at which individual features seem to reveal the most information, uh, which seem to be most discriminative in the different classes we were looking at. Um, and uh, to do this, we use a simple metric called information gain um, that looked, again, only at the individual features. Uh, and it turned out that in the composer and regional style experiments, the engram features did not have particularly high information gain. Collectively, they seem to, to do useful things, but looking at them individually, they did not have a high discriminative power. Um, however, in the genre experiment, uh, the top three features were all engram features, um, and five of the top seven features were engram features. Um, so that was a really interesting result, we thought. Um, and looking at the particular features, and I won't get into the details of what each of them are, but the general pattern emerged the melodic uh, and ground features seem to be especially important, um, and also features that emphasize diversity rather than looking at specific engrams or how often specific engrams occurred um, seem to be the most successful. In, in fact, all of uh, these five features that were the, the highest in information game uh, were diversity-oriented features. So to, to uh, look at overall conclusions, we can say that our experiments show that the new JSON symbolic engram features clearly encapsulate useful information about music, but can be less effective if only consumed uh, or only uh, considered alone. So it is still very much useful to use other kinds of features um, as well. So it's good to have a broader spectrum of features uh, of which engrams can certainly play a useful part. Um, they do add that additional consideration of sequence and local behavior to the, the broader features that, that don't model that as well. Uh, of course, there's much more that can be done with engrams. I've already talked about some areas where more research is needed. Um, another uh, thing we really want to focus on in the future is how we can make these engram features more interpretable. Range has an intuitive meaning, um, but some of the, the names of the engrams like you see here have less of an intuitive musical meaning. Um, and also, we want to have better engrams uh, and also better features to extract from engrams. Um, and also, we want to look at certain kinds of things um, like how we can deal with imitation, how we can use engrams to measure imitation in useful ways, um, and even look at things like meta-engrams, which is, say, engrams of engrams. So the final thing I want to say before finishing um, is just to acknowledge how important multidisciplinarity has been to all of this work that we've done, uh, not only this project, but many other projects that we've been involved with. Um, we've collaborated with musicologists, theorists, computer scientists, librarians, cognitive scientists, music information retrieval researchers, and others. And it's really that diverse expertise that has really allowed us to do a lot of the things um, that we've done. And I think that's one of the great things about DH as a conference, is you really do see this very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary spirit. Um, and I think that that's really important. Um, so with that spirit in mind, if any of you have any uh, suggestions from your own field, how you think we could improve what we're doing, um, those would be very much greatly appreciated. And if there's anything that we're doing that we think would be useful to your own research, whether it's in music or something else, um, we're always looking for collaboration. So thank you to our funding agencies, SHRC and FRQSC, um, and thank you to you for your attention.